Lucius Quinctius Flamininus, Consul 192 BCE. The younger brother of Titus Flamininus, the young consul who defeated Philip V at Sinocephaly, Lucius Flamininus was a valuable legate for his brother and a political force in his own right. Much like his brother, this young patrician matured quickly as he came of age during the latter stages of the grueling Second Punic War. Upon his brother's election to the consulship in 198, Lucius was tasked with being his second in command in a war where the Romans were leading what amounted to a Panhellenic coalition against Antigonid Macedon. Gamely taking command of the fleet, Lucius Flamininus continued to score victories on Euboea. Despite failing to capture Corinth and losing Argos to the talented Macedonian general Philocles, Lucius's diplomatic work helped to bring the Achaean League and Sparta into the Roman coalition and to further alienate Philip and confine him to the defensive. Returning home, Lucius shared in his brother's glory and the immense wealth they won, ultimately prevailing over Scipio Nasica in one of the most exacting elections ever held for the patrician consulship in 192. Once in office, Lucius and his colleague were thrust into action in northern Italy. Lucius Flamininus had a great deal of success winning battles against both the Ligures and the Boii. Before leaving office, the outgoing consul also raised the army which would go on to oust Antiochus III the Great from Greece at the Battle of Thermopylae. By the 180s, the three titans of Roman politics were Scipio Africanus, Cato the Elder, and Titus Flamininus, with the three jockeying to win honors and influence for their followers, while also stymieing the advancement of each other's preferred candidates. When Cato served as censor in 184 BCE, he decided to attack the Flamininus brothers directly by expelling Lucius from the Senate on moral grounds. This expulsion was largely unprecedented, as consulars were rarely, if ever, removed from the rolls. The charge was that Lucius, as consul, had murdered a Boian in order to appease the anger of his Carthaginian boyfriend. While it seemed that Lucius's career was set to end in ignominy, the Roman people threatened to riot at the games unless Lucius were reinstated immediately. What follows is the wild story of Titus Flamininus's younger brother, a flamboyant figure whose talent ultimately outweighed his flaws and failures. Lucius Quinctius Cincinnatus was one of the true giants of Roman history, and during the early Republic, the name Quinctius was often associated with high office. But after about the middle of the 4th century, the family really went quiet. And in fact, it seems that the dominant Cincinnatus branch had died out entirely. The Flamininus branch, of which our hero today is descended, was pretty slow to get into a prominent position. So there's about a hundred year gap when it comes to having a Quinctius holding a high office. The last consul to be a direct ancestor of Lucius and his brother Titus and to hold the consulship was their great-grandfather all the way back in 271. As for their father Titus, he seems to have died young before he could have done much, but the two boys had an uncle named Kaiso, which was a very prominent name within the family, and by the way almost an exclusively patrician first name, who built a temple of Concord in 217. They also had a distant cousin named Titus Quinctius Crispinus, who became consul in 208. So the family was making a bit of a comeback, and the Crispinus branch was one that went way back to the beginning. So the family was trending in the right direction by the time that Titus and Lucius came into the world, but still it was a long way removed from the absolute pinnacle of Roman politics that Cincinnatus had represented. Titus Flamininus, the older of the two brothers, was born in 228, and Lucius was born thereafter. We're not sure exactly how long after, but I'm assuming by about 225, Lucius was in the world. What's interesting is that Lucius was supposed to have been a very precocious young man who was quite intelligent for his age, and we see that by the fact that he's elected to the College of Augurs in 213. And our sources note that the... Uh, augurships were open because of the massive number of deaths in the Senate after Cannae, and so um, Lucius was most likely inducted as an augur when he was about 12 years old. So that would have been the first 
major step forward in his life. And from that point forward, he would have in, entered a military service as a teenager and gained quite a bit of military experience in the late stages of the Second Punic War. When Lucius Flaminius was coming of age during the Second Punic War, most of the senior offices were very much dominated by an older group of men who had survived Cannae and were proven commanders. They would get elected over and over, but the junior ranks were wide open. So guys who were even in their early to mid 20s were being elected to public offices that otherwise they would not have been able to attain for a decade or more. Lucius, while he will not benefit from that as much as say his older brother, clearly had to have served as keister during that time. In 201, the year between the Second Punic and Second Macedonian Wars, he was elected Curule Edile, and this was the exact right moment for maximum political gain, because during this year, the Roman people were finally at peace, and they were quite rapturous about finally being rid of the Second Punic War, and finally having beaten Hannibal. So all of the games that Lucius Laminina sponsored, no doubt, had a positive impact and were well received. In 200, the Second Macedonian War broke out, and he ran for Praetor that year, knowing that the war was going to last at least another year. So he thought that he had a pretty good chance, one in four, of being sent with the army in Macedon. But instead, he was elected, and then he served as urban Praetor. So he was assigned that duty by the Senate, and this must have been more than a little bit annoying for him, since he was a man of action. That being said, this year he got an opportunity to ingratiate himself with veterans and he wasn't stuck in Rome as he thought he would be. So he was out mostly in rural Italy allotting land to some veterans coming back from Iberia. Then he received news from Rome that his brother had successfully won the consulship for 198 and he had been assigned command in Macedon. So one of Titus's first acts as consul was to prorogue Lucius's authority as praetor and bring him along as a second in command for the war against Philip V. So this was going to be a great opportunity for Lucius, and given that his brother is his immediate superior, he was going to have quite a bit more latitude than your average pro praetor could expect to have in a war like this. The surface reason for the Roman Republic entering the Second Macedonian War is that they were coming to the aid of their allies in the Greek world. The reality was closer to this being simply a war of revenge. Right after the Battle of Cannae, Philip V had opportunistically declared war on the Republic and forced him to fight an unneeded secondary theater. The Romans had managed to fight this on a shoestring budget by dispatching a small fleet with a few thousand men and a lot of gold. They had effectively funded the Aetolians to fight on their behalf and kept Philip contained in the Balkans. They had made peace, and this war had not really been all that closely connected with the Second Punic War as a whole. Most of the Roman people had largely forgotten about Macedon, and very few Romans actually served in the First Macedonian War. So they were content to let bygones be bygones if they remembered that there were any bygones that were gone. And so Rome was settling into peace. The people had been at war for about 20 years. They were tired, and they wanted nothing to do with any kind of adventurism. For the Senate, however, they knew that Macedon had done them wrong and that Macedon needed to pay. So after a year of peace, the Senate decided to force the issue and press for war. This was deeply unpopular, but the Senate was able to make it happen. Interestingly enough, though, despite the Senate really riding roughshod over its own people and pressing them into a war that nobody wanted, they also weren't able to do so quite quickly enough to please the Aetolians. The Aetolians had been begging for aid for a year or two by the time the Romans entered, and when the Romans did finally come into the war, the Aetolians were thoroughly disgruntled. So one of the tasks facing the Flamininus brothers will actually be to get the Aetolians back on board. The early operations of this war were conducted by the consuls Publius Sulpicius Galba, a veteran of the First Macedonian War, and his successor, Publius Vilius Tapulus. And those campaigns in 200 and 199 respectively went okay. Most of the successes that both consuls had were actually from their praetors who were commanding the fleet. That being said, because this war hadn't been popular to start with, there was a lot of pressure at home to end it quickly. 
There was also some fear in Rome among the senators that if they didn't act quickly enough, Philip would either find a way to revive his fortunes or be bailed out by his neighbor and possible secret ally, Antiochus III of the Seleucid Empire. And so, in desperation and also looking for someone who could bring this to an end, the Romans turned to a young consul for 198, Titus Flamininus, and he decided that he would end the war and he would do so in the company of his brother, today's subject, Lucius Quinctius Flamininus. It might seem a bit nepotistic that Titus Flamininus selected Lucius to be his second in command. However, we have to keep in mind that that was by no means abnormal. Back during the Second Punic War, to give a recent example, during the Iberian Campaign, the future Scipio Africanus had relied primarily upon his younger brother Lucius and his best friend Gaius Laelius to be his primary legates. Even before that, his father and uncle had been a command team in Iberia as well. So Titus Lemoninus was actually following a fairly well-known model, and certainly one of his chief rivals, Scipio Africanus, would have had no reason to complain about it, given that he had done the same thing. And also that he would do the same thing again in less than 10 years when his brother Lucius was elected consul and then chose none other than Scipio Africanus to be his chief legate. But let's not get into that. That kind of nepotism was pretty common. The only thing that was a little bit more uncommon would be the youth of this command team. Titus, the elder brother, was only 29 years old. And Lucius was perhaps 25 to 27. So this would have been a very young tag team, yet we have to remember that despite their youth, these men are not lacking in experience. They grew up during the Second Punic War. Both of them had seen quite a bit of combat, and both of them had a good degree of talent and charisma, especially Titus. One other factor to keep in mind is that Titus really valued the kind of trust he had with Lucius. And this will become especially important because not only was this a military campaign, this was also very much a political and diplomatic affair. And because Titus and Lucius were close, that meant that any foreign ambassadors meeting with Lucius could make an agreement with him that Titus would most likely honor. So this meant that in effect, Titus Lemoninus could be two places at once when it came to his ability to communicate with and work with his allies. So that factor is actually very important for understanding how Titus Lemoninus brought the war to a conclusion and also how he expanded the coalition. Because as we'll see, Lucius Lemoninus's primary contributions were more diplomatic than military when all is said and done. Lucius Quinctius Flamininus, therefore, went to Piraeus, where he became the third and final Roman admiral of the Second Punic War. He had some pretty big shoes to fill, as his two predecessors, Gaius Claudius Kentho and Lucius Apustius Fullo, had acquitted themselves quite capably in this role, and they had left him in good standing. After their work, and also, let's not forget the work of the Rhodians and Pergamenes, the Allies enjoyed naval superiority. There were really only about 20 or so Macedonian ships remaining, and as it turns out, they hadn't left port in about a year, nor would they. So Lucius Lemoninus therefore had a pretty free hand, and he wisely chose to follow in the footsteps of Apustius Fullo and continue to hammer away at Macedon's hold on the island of Euboea. Euboea was right off the coast of Attica, which is the home of Athens, and since Athens was one of the more important allies that Rome had in the Greek world, one of the overarching missions of the Roman admirals had been to keep the Macedonians at bay and prevent them from capturing the city. By this point, however, Lucius's brother Titus was putting a lot more pressure on Philip elsewhere, and there was very little danger of a direct attack on Athens. Not to mention that because the war had been going on for a couple years, the Athenians had shored up their defenses even more than had been previously the case. So Lucius decided to go and try to capture a few more cities on Euboea. His two biggest gains were the city of Eritrea, which is probably the biggest remaining stronghold, 
And this was a fairly significant gain as he sacked the city and managed to make away with a lot of loot. The Romans were eager looters, and it appears that Lucius Laminius was able to enrich himself at Eritrea, which was known for having lots of ancient statues and paintings. We know that several years later he will be engaged in an extremely expensive election, and most likely a lot of the money that he had for that election came from this particular sack. He also managed to take the city of Caristus. And these were two of the handful of remaining Macedonian strongholds. The one most important stronghold, however, that the Romans were not able to acquire was Chalcis. So he tried and failed to capture Chalcis. But nonetheless, most of Euboea, or at least a substantial portion, was now in Roman hands, and the Macedonians did not have the fleet in place to take advantage of their remaining possessions on Euboea anyway. So for the most part, he had done even more to reduce the threat to Athens, and he could now focus on some more interesting targets. Unlike Apustius Fulo, who decided to sail to the heart of Macedon, however, he was thinking of doing something a little bit closer to his base at Piraeus, and also potentially a little bit more strategically important. Lucius Flamininus was no doubt disappointed that he had not succeeded in taking Chalcis, which was one of the three fetters of Greece. However, that did not deter him in any way from going after the most important of the three, Corinth. So Corinth was right at the throat of the entrance to the Peloponnese. And this is a narrow overland entry into the Peloponnesian Peninsula. So this was an important base that Philip could use to have a presence in southern Greece. And he could also march from especially the Acro Corinth, which is one of the greatest fortresses in the Greek world, and still threaten Athens and places in central Greece that were not far away. So if Lucius were to seize this city by surprise, which is what he was trying to do, then this would be a huge victory, and it would really cripple Philip's ability to operate in the south. Not only that, but politically, it would be a very useful asset for the Romans as well, as this might be the diplomatic chip that they would need to bring the Achaean League over to their side. Up to this point, the Achaeans had been more or less aligned with Philip, but very loosely. There was a lot of dissension among their ranks. When they met as a congress at Sicyon, they were quite divided as to whether they should go with the Romans or stay loyal to Philip. And the main consideration is that with Philip in control of Corinth, this enabled him to potentially raid them at will. And also, if he were to reconcile with the Aetolians, their traditional foes, then he might ferry the Aetolians into their lands as well. And so they wanted this blight removed. It was a fetter of Greece, and they were the primary prisoners shackled in the dungeon. And so Lucius knew that if he could offer them Corinth, that might be enough to induce them to switch sides. So he actually attended a league meeting at Sicyon after he landed, and when he made this offer, a majority of league members voted to switch sides to the Romans, but this really caused those pre-existing tensions to reach the breaking point because three cities, including most notably Argos, still favored Philip and decided to withdraw from the proceedings and more or less unofficially withdraw from the Achaean League altogether. So this was a diplomatic coup for Lucius, even if it was a rather messy one. Now let's get to the military operations that accompanied all of this, since those operations began a little bit before these negotiations and continued well after them. One of the things that made Corinth so important was not just the fact that it lay astride the entrance to the Peloponnese, but also that it was situated so as to have a port on both the Aegean and the Gulf of Corinth side. So one port faced west, one port faced east. And Lucius was able to seize the port of Chinchreae on the Aegean coast without too much difficulty. So he and Attalus were able to achieve surprise and seize the port, and due to the smallness of their army, although they were able to begin a siege at Acrocorinth, they were not able to press it too far. Acrocorinth was the site of Philip's garrison, and this was one of the most formidable garrisons and fortresses in the Greek world. So if you had to narrow down Corinth to exactly where that fetter was located, it would be at the fortress of the Acrocorinth. And this is partly why Lucius chose this moment to go to Sicyon to try to get Achaean aid. Uh, 
and he succeeded. So although the Achaean League support kind of was a little wobbly due to the withdrawal of the Argives and some other things, he still had reinforcements that he would need, and especially siege equipment. So his force was relatively light, and most likely neither the Romans nor the Pergamines had any kind of major siege equipment that they could move overland from the port to Agro-Corinth. And we know they must have had some because the previous year Apustius had mounted a siege on an island, but this would not be enough gear to take something like Acro-Corinth. Of course, he's also worried that reinforcements might come to relieve the garrison, so he needs to have the Achaeans show up quickly and try to make a decision. Now, the problem he faced is that the people of Corinth were firmly with the Macedonians. It's not clear whether he knew this would be the case or not. But the Macedonians were not simply having to fight this by themselves because the citizens of Corinth rallied to their aid and assisted them on the walls. That being said, the Allies were still making progress, but unfortunately for the Romans, a new force of Macedonians showed up from Boeotia, led by a general called Philocles. He led a relief column of some 1,500 men, and they were able to force Lucius Flamininus to break the siege and retreat. So this was one of the more positive developments for Philip during a year that overall did not go super well. But actually Philocles was not done doing well for his king and making life difficult for the Flamininus brothers. At this point, one assumes that Lucius Flamininus must have retreated, perhaps only to Chinchere and perhaps as far away as Piraeus. Winter would have set in. But Philocles was not done for the year yet. Hearing that the Argives were looking to join the Macedonian cause, he took his army and marched to the Argolid, where he entered Argos to what we assume is a rapturous welcome. Argos officially left the Achaean League and joined the Macedonian cause. Most likely, there were some people in Argos who were not happy to see this happen, but it seems that a majority, or at least a solid number of the people in power, wanted this to be the case. Argos almost certainly thought that they would join as an independent ally of the Macedonians and that they would not be asked to join any other power in some sort of an alliance. But if that was what they were hoping for, they were sorely mistaken and they had forgotten that they now lived in the era of leagues, where the only way to compete with kings is by forming up into leagues. And so Perhaps predictably, they were betrayed almost immediately by Philip, who ordered his general Philocles to hand Argos over to Nabus of Sparta. Up to this point, Nabus had been a foe to the Achaean League, and he had been a somewhat unreliable ally to Macedon. But because overall things were closing in on Philip, he was eager to keep Nabus engaged on his side, and so he handed Argos over to him. For the Argives, this was a major blow, personally and, of course, in terms of their independence being lost. And part of this is because Sparta and Argos had for centuries been rivals. They dated their rivalry back, in fact, before it was probably a thing. But certainly, by the late Archaic period, these two powers had been butting heads for a while, and during the Classical period, they would periodically, every 20 or 30 years, fight a major battle supposedly for hegemony of the Peloponnese. And so for the city to be handed over to an ancestral enemy in this way was a massive betrayal. That being said, Nabus made things worse immediately by beginning to implement unpopular reforms from the minute he took over. And so this was a potential powder keg. But fortunately for the Romans, at least, Nabus was kind of your traditional dictator in the sense that he was mostly interested in his own advancement and didn't really care too much about, say, his ostensible allies. Nabus is often portrayed in sources such as Polybius as being a bit of a mad dog, but he certainly wasn't a fool, and he realized that Argos would never gladly accept Spartan rule, nor would the Argives like his reforms. And so, in order to hang on to Argos, which was by far the most important acquisition he had made, he decided that it was necessary to make peace immediately with the Achaeans and the Romans. 
And so his first move once Philocles was out the gate was to send messages immediately to Lucius Flamininus and offer peace. So his offer was effectively that he would not only cease hostility against the Achaean League in every form, but also that he would be willing to send a relatively small number of men north to help Titus Flamininus's army as it invaded Thessaly to face Philip. As for Lucius and Titus, they were very happy with this. This was exactly what they wanted, and they didn't really give two shits about the fate of Argos. So they immediately accepted this incredible free gift. This effectively closed off the entirety of the Peloponnese to Philip and freed up all the available Roman forces for Titus Flamininus' great drive into Macedon. That, of course, would culminate in his that being Titus in this case, his great victory at Sinocephaly. So this was very important. And really, this diplomatic coup was the highlight of Lucius's tenure, but it was actually not his final operation in the Greek world. With the Peloponnese now effectively closed as a theater of operations, Lucius Flamininus was able to shift his attention elsewhere. While his good friend and ally King Attalus went to Thebes in order to help Titus on a diplomatic mission, Lucius would lead his forces into the Gulf of Corinth in order to aid Rome's long-suffering ally, Aetolia. And because of geography, this meant they had to sail around the entire Peloponnese, which would have taken at least a few weeks. So even after he was freed to do this operation, there was still even more delay. The Aetolians had borne the brunt of Philip's wrath before the Romans had even entered the war, and they had long been suffering as a result of this conflict. The Romans also had not really prioritized helping them the way that they had help, uh, prioritized helping, say, Pergamon or Athens. And so the Aetolians up to this point had really just been getting ravaged over and over every year. Their current predators were actually not the Macedonians who were on the back foot by this point, but their near neighbors, the Acarnanian League. Now, the Acarnanian League had been a traditional enemy to the Aetolians, and they were actually organized relatively similarly with a kind of federal league and a capital city where the various constituent tribes and cities would get together and vote. Knowing that the wind had shifted and that the momentum was all with Rome, the Acarnanians had actually come very close to voting to switch sides and join the Roman cause, but that plunder out of Aetolia was just a little too sweet, and so they voted by a narrow margin to remain allies of Philip. Perhaps they thought that their rural stronghold would be not too much of a tempting target for the Romans, but they hadn't counted on being the only available target. And so Lucius Flamininus arrived and started to attack Acarnania. It's also worth mentioning that King Attalus, who traveled to Thebes in order to help out Titus, ended up having a massive stroke when he was scheduled to speak there. And because of that stroke, he went back to Pergamon and died not long thereafter. That being said, it does appear that in all likelihood, a lot of the Pergamene forces remained with the Romans. And so he still had use of the fleet and some of their men, although he was bereft of the very talented King Attalus, which was quite unfortunate. By the summer of 197, Lucius Flamininus had arrived in Acarnania, and he made straight for their capital city at Lucas. This was a bloody battle where the Acarnanians fought hard, and while he did manage to take the city and the Acarnanians retreated, this had not broken their spirit, and in fact they were ready themselves for another round of fighting when news arrived not long after the battle that Sinocephaly had already been decided and that Philip V had been destroyed. And so, because the war was now over, the Acarnanians duly made peace, knowing that they, on their own accord, weren't really going to be able to do anything. So if they had been holding out hope that Philip might win a pitched battle and then turn things around, that hope was dashed immediately, and so they were forced to make peace with Lucius Flamininus. In order to understand the rest of Lucius Flamininus' life and career, we need to consider some of the developments back at Rome, which occurred while he and his brother were still away in Greece. For starters, the Senate voted the year that he was commanding his fleet in 198 to expand a number of praetorships from four to six. And this was one of the first times that the Republic had acknowledged 
that their current number of magistrates was no longer adequate for meeting the republic's needs. Now that they had permanent governors in places such as Sicily, they would need more magistrates each year in order to meet that need. In 195, the very same year that Titus Flamininus was waging his war against Nabus of Sparta, who, spoiler, turned out to be a problem, the Senate, against the strenuous objections of the reigning consul Cato the Elder, suspended the Lex Appia. So for the last 20 years, there had been a law in place that prevented women from using or owning luxury items, and now that had been suspended, now that Rome was no longer engaged in life or death struggles with Hannibal. Cato, by the way, also managed to pass another major piece of legislation where Roman citizens were now exempted from a number of humiliating or damaging forms of torture. That gained him a great deal of popularity. And then in his proconsulship in 194, he went on to win a great battle in Iberia, which earned him a triumph. So by the time that Cato made it home, this was also when Titus Flamininus came home, and the two of them had done enough now to really establish themselves as, if not quite equal to Scipio Africanus, then at least powerful and important enough to offset his power. So now we have a three-way politics in Rome where you have three titans, and most of the other politicians in Rome would associate with either Scipio, Flamininus, or Cato. Another thing that starts in 195 that might seem trivial at first, but will turn out to be incredibly important for Lucius, is that that same year, the Senate voted to start having senators seated separately from the common people at games. So before, everybody sat together, and now there was sort of an assigned seating scheme, and it was even ranked where consuls would sit in one spot and then, say, praetors would sit in another. So the Senate was more or less increasing its own privileges. And again, for Lucius, this would end up having some significance of a positive variety. In 194, both Titus Flamininus and Cato the Elder celebrated great triumphs, and this meant that both of their names were still prominent. In 192, it was time for Lucius Flamininus to run for the consulship, but he faced a stiff competitor in the form of Scipio Africanus' cousin, Publius Cornelius Scipio Nasica. Both of these men had a lot of name recognition, and both of them were backed by one of the major titans in Roman politics. Typically speaking, the patrician consulship was not nearly as competitive because there were, frankly, fewer patricians. But this year was an exception, and it appears that this race was one of the more noteworthy elections of the era, that things got pretty heated and that it came down to the last vote. So normally in a Roman election, things would be over fairly quickly and common people and their voting tribes might not even get the vote. But in this case, they were there all day and it took a very long time for Lucius Lemoninus to secure enough votes to have a majority and win the seat. To give you an idea of how popular Scipio Nasica was, or at least how much support he had in an election, he would be elected the very next year. Most likely the thing that put Lucius a little bit above Scipio Nasica is that Titus had triumphed just two years before, and while Scipio Nasica was a cousin to the even more famous Scipio Africanus, that was not as near a relationship, and Scipio Africanus's achievements had been a full decade before. So recency very much favored Lucius Lemoninus, and he got the nod by, well, a nod. The Roman Republic had actually only acquired Cisalpine Gaul, that is Gaul around the Po River and then the foothills of the Alps, in the 220s, right before the outbreak of the Second Punic War. Not only had the local tribes here furnished men to Hannibal's army, but they also were still not quite fully content with Roman rule. And so it should come as no surprise that there was another war in this region in the late 190s. The war was serious enough that both consuls, Lucius Flamininus and his plebeian colleague, Gnaeus Domitius Ahenobarbus, were sent in order to go fight the Boii. And the Boii turned out to not be alone, because while Lucius was marching up to fight the Boii, he happened to encounter 
the Ligures near the what is now the city of Pisa. He actually fought and won a field battle where he killed 9,000 men and then laid siege to their camp, but they were then able to escape by night. After that point, he then marched over to face the Boii, but they proved to be elusive. And in the middle of the campaign, he had to leave his army in place while he rushed back to Rome to oversee elections for his replacement, and then he hurried back to the north to try to conclude his campaign. Upon his return, he was able to corner the Boii and force them to surrender. In terms of why he didn't get a triumph for his victory over the Ligures, most likely it's simply because you had to think about the kind of competition that he had at the time and the scale of the victories that other people had gotten triumphs for. Technically, killing 5,000 enemies in a battle was enough to qualify for a triumph, but at this point, 9,000 seemed like small potatoes. Not to mention that we also have to keep in mind that Cato and Scipio would not want Titus Lemoninus' brother to win a triumph unless he really way overperformed. And so this is why Lucius Lemoninus received no real reward for his victory. However, he did receive more work as a reward. So right after he got back to Rome and had disbanded his army, the Senate asked him to raise yet another army, but this time for the benefit of the incoming consul, Manius Achilleus Glabrio, who would then lead that army into the War of the Seleucid Empire. Glabrio, by the way, would win at the Battle of Thermopylae with as legate none other than Cato the Elder. So in many ways, Lucius was forced to do a lot of the dirty work for a political rival. Cato the Elder was the leading moralist of his time. He liked to talk ad nauseum about how Rome's moral standards had fallen off a cliff. And finally, in 184, the Romans elected him censor, and he had a chance to grind some of his moral axes. He decided to really go after his opponents, and his enforcement of morality was, as is almost always the case, uneven. So some of the people he went after, we can see that there were moral prerogatives at play, and with other people he went after, it was clearly much more political or personal. By this time, Roman politics had been a three-way race for about a decade, and Cato had especially become not too happy with Scipio Africanus. That being said, Scipio was personally untouchable, and while Cato and Titus Lemoninus were mostly on decent terms, Cato was a bit jealous of Titus because Titus was 10 years younger, better looking, and more popular. So Cato was looking to even the score and perhaps advance his own interest as well as reforming Roman morals as he saw it. So, whereas most censors go after relatively small players in the Senate to make their point, Cato the Elder decided to use the censorship to make a splash, and that's most likely why an alternative name for him is Cato the Censor, since his censorship is almost certainly the best remembered of any censorship in Roman history. During a typical censorship, the censors would remove about six or seven people from the Senate rolls. And this was mostly just to keep the body from getting too big. Most of the people they removed were relative no ones. They were either an active member, say someone who had achieved a junior office and hadn't really done anything in 20 years, or else it would be someone who was making a lot of ruckus and they were kind of a disruptive younger member. But it typically was not someone with a large following or someone who was important to the body's operation. Cato went after at least two very prominent people, one of whom was Lucius. Probably the dumbest case that he brought before the Senate as censor was the case of a praetor whose offense was embracing his wife in daylight and being seen to be affectionate with his wife in front of his daughter. And to us, this seems like a goofy law, and even the Romans thought this was goofy. This was a kind of archaic law from way back, something that hadn't been enforced in centuries, that Cato wanted to bring back for whatever reason. And so this praetor had quite a bit of sympathy from his colleagues for being found guilty of this and expelled from the Senate. It's also worth noting, ironically enough, that years later when Cato was becoming age-addled, that he himself engaged in this very same behavior in front of his kids, and when they chastised him for it, he basically just told them to fuck off. <laughs> 
But if this Praetor's expulsion was the most absurd example, then it must be said that the one that really got Cato into trouble was expelling Lucius Flamininus for a scandal that had happened almost a decade earlier when he had been consul. The way that Livy explains this is very much focused on the scandal and not on the procedure. So the way that he presents it is effectively that Cato more or less just announced that Lucius was no longer a member of the Senate and then bother explaining why. Well, as one might imagine, people were curious why one of their former consuls was now no longer a member of their body. And so Titus Flamininus demanded an answer. So he actually summoned a contio, which is a non-voting assembly of people. And after getting the crowd riled up, he had Cato come in to explain his decision. Surprisingly, Cato did show up and he was well prepared. He actually had written out an entire speech where he explained his reasoning for removing Lucius Flamininus from the Senate. Livy had a copy of this speech, which is now lost, and he used it in order to compose his account. The summary goes as follows. Back when Lucius had presumably been consul in 192, he had casually murdered a Boian because that Boian had interrupted himself and his boyfriend Philip the Carthaginian when they were trying to enjoy either some sort of pastime or a gladiator contest or something of that nature. And because Philip had become so angered by this interruption, in order to appease his lover's anger, uh, Lucius had actually murdered that this Boian be killed by one of his guards. And so this was an obvious abuse of power, and clearly it's morally objectionable. That being said, it was very rare for the Romans to go after one another for abuses against non-Romans. In fact, this was fairly unprecedented. It also was the first time that a Roman consular had been booted from the Senate since the time of Marcus, Liv Marcus Livius Salinator in 219, and his crimes had been more financial, which means that he had done discernible damage to the Roman Republic and had uh, ripped off the people. So um, Cato was so confident in his position that he apparently asked Lucius if he would like to have a formal trial backed by money sureties i.e. meaning that the winner would make money and the loser would take a bath. And Lucius declined this offer by simply not responding, and so Cato assumed that he had won the day and that the issue was settled, that Lucius was clearly guilty, and that was that. But what he didn't count on is the fact that the Flamininus brothers are quite popular and that they know how to play to the crowd. He would find out the hard way. The crowd reaction to the confrontation between Titus Flamininus and Cato the Elder isn't clear. However, it does seem that they were at least willing to go home and disperse that day. Not too long thereafter, there was a public game, most likely at the Circus Maximus. And as we have already mentioned, for the last 10 years or so, it had been the custom for the senators to sit together with the consulars being singled out with the best seats in the house. The people happened to notice that all of the consulars were seated in the correct place, but Lucius Flamininus was seated by himself away from the rest of the Senate. And this apparently offended the people who felt like Lucius was being discriminated against. And so they began to interrupt the games and to be loud and disruptive, effectively threatening a riot unless Lucius were given his rightful place. And so, fearing the crowd, the Senate apparently acquiesced, and Lucius took his seat, almost certainly by his brother, and the races went on. Now, the way that Livy tells the story doesn't really give us a whole lot to work with. We only get the sense of drama that this would have entailed, but not sort of the institutional implications. So was it simply the case that the crowd demanded that Lucius be seated with the consulars, or did they demand his full restoration to the Senate? We simply don't know. So there is a possibility at least that he remained expelled and simply was seated with them at games for the next 14 years, or that he was fully restored and that Cato had taken a massive L. It's also not really clear whether this was spontaneous since the incident of his expulsion was very well known, or if 
Titus, Scipio, or some other opponent of Cato had helped Lucius by getting the crowd nice and riled up, if this had been planned, that is to say. And so, while Livy doesn't really say so very clearly, the implication seems to be that Lucius was probably fully reinstated to the Senate with all of his honors. That being said, one has to imagine that with the story like that more or less being confirmed rather than simply a rumor that the soldier involved might have spread to his friends over a drink, that this would have done a little bit of damage to Lucius, but let's not get carried away with the amount of damage. Because we have to remember something about the Roman people, and that is that they were deeply xenophobic. So this was always a feature of the Roman people's voting behavior during the Republic. Even with people who had done them no real harm, like, say, their Italian allies, they were not very eager to share citizenship. When it came to giving rights to, say, the Greeks, the Romans were quite opposed. In fact, the Roman Senate felt more comfortable granting rights to places like Gaul ahead of Greece. And we have to understand something else, too. The Boian who had been murdered was a member of the Boii, who were a subset of the Gauls. And for the Romans, the Gauls were effectively the boogeymen of the world, due to the sack of Rome back in 396 BCE by Brennus. And so, because not 396, 390, sorry. Anyhow, um, the Romans had a deep-seated, visceral, irrational hatred of the Gauls, and so the fact that Lucius killed a Gaul is irrelevant. After all, hadn't he killed at least 9,000 more of them in one battle, not to mention his other operations? So what difference does one dead Gaul make? And also, the fact that he might have had a boyfriend from Carthage was apparently irrelevant, and it appears that most people really didn't care about that. Either that, or they thought that that particular detail was off in some way. At any rate, it does go to show you that the Roman people often would rally to the defense of the powerful in ways that perhaps don't make sense to us today. And also that some figures like Lucius Flaminus enjoyed a level of popularity where we're not sure exactly how he earned it, or exactly why the people were so insistent that he be honored in this way, since of course he was not quite the benefactor for them that his brother was. Lucius Quinctius Flamininus was not necessarily a military genius, but he was multi-talented, and he clearly was capable of operating as either a military commander, a diplomat, or as a politician in the Senate. He was not on the same level as his brother Titus Flamininus, but he wasn't necessarily a scrub either. And he contributed to the campaign that would make his brother one of the great legends in Roman history, and also reduce Macedon's standing in the world permanently. He ultimately received no triumph for his victories over the Ligures and Boii, and if my suspicions are correct, a lot of that might have to do with the standards of the time, where Roman armies had won in recent years some fairly major victories, and this also was in the context of a world where Cato was beginning to mastered the art of obstructionism to prevent his rivals from accruing honors. And so I wouldn't be surprised if Cato actually heard the story about Lucius's dalliance with Philip the Carthaginian, and that was his ostensible motive for preventing Lucius from receiving a triumph. Later on, when Cato was censor and he expelled Lucius from the Senate, that was an extremely unusual incident. And in fact, I would say that that is the thing that gets Lucius mentioned in the modern scholarly literature more than anything else, because it is a highly unusual procedure. Um, what's also of equal interest, at least to me, is the backlash to it. One would think that people wouldn't be all that interested in the political journey of someone who had been consul eight years before. But in fact, the Roman people very much rallied to the defense of Lucius Flamininus, and my suspicion is because either they felt like Cato had overreached in general, or they simply didn't care about the lives of non-Romans. If he wanted to go around and murder non-Romans, especially Gauls, then that wasn't really that big of a deal. Or if he wanted to take a boyfriend, they might mock him for it, but ultimately it 
wasn't really that important. Lucius Flaminius would die in 170, and we know this because that was the year when his spot in the College of Augurs became vacant, and so that must have been the year when he died, since the augury was a position that one held for life. Until next time, I'm Thersites the Historian, and I'll be coming back to you soon with another Roman of renown.